All right, time to get serious here. We're getting into the nitty gritty. Mixing Foundations Compression. This is my favorite tool in the mix, compressor. And a friend of mine who used to work with me in the studio a little bit, he said, the more I mix, the more I realize that mixing pretty much is compression. Now, when you're done this training, I think you'll see what he means. Of course, there are a lot of other things going into mixing than just compression, but I think by the end of this and seeing some real world mixes come together, you're gonna see why he said that. And I really do think compression is probably the most powerful tool we have in the mix. So before we get into why I think that, let's just cover the basics. What is a compressor? Well, a compressor just automatically turns down the signal based on a set threshold. It's like a really simple robot. You tell it, hey, when the signal gets above this level, turn it down. That's essentially what the compressor is doing. And so it helps us control the dynamics. And what are dynamics? Well, dynamics is just the difference between the loudest and the quietest parts of a sound. And when you start using compression, it kind of does some funny things to our, to our minds. You know, by turning down the loudest peaks in a song, well, it makes the quieter sections sound louder, which makes the overall track sound louder. So it's kind of a weird thing that actually something that is designed just to turn things down actually can make things sound louder. It's kind of interesting. It helps us make sure an instrument is heard well enough all the way through a track. For example, of course, a vocal, you want to hear all the words. You don't want to miss the quiet words or you don't want to have a loud line really jump out and sound annoyingly loud. And this is really just the basic, basic function of a compressor, but that's just scratching the surface. Before we go deeper, let's talk about all the controls on a compressor. First, we have the threshold, and the threshold is just the point at which the compressor will kick in and start turning down the signal. Now, in some compressors like this one on the screen, you control the threshold. Uh, in others, the threshold is just hardwired. It's just hard set at a certain level, and so you just control the input level going into the unit to control how much compression it's doing. So if you look where this red arrow is pointing here, that little line, you can see where the input signal is. Well, it's basically anything that crosses that line, that's when the compressor is going to kick in. And this compressor, this is a distressor model here, um, there is no threshold control. It's just a hard set threshold, and so if you want to push the signal past the threshold, you turn up the input knob to feed more signal in, cross that threshold more, and thus compress more. So whether it's an input knob or a threshold knob, it doesn't really matter. It essentially accomplishes the same thing. Next, let's talk about the ratio control. Now this is sometimes a bit of a hard concept to wrap your head around. I'll try to explain it best I can. The ratio is essentially how aggressively the compressor attenuates the signal. So a four to one ratio means that for every four dB that the signal exceeds the threshold, it's only going to allow it to exceed by one dB. So yes, I know that's kind of confusing. Uh, let me try to give you an example. So let's say you have a threshold of minus 10 dB. Okay, that's your threshold and your ratio is four to one. So minus 10 is your threshold and your signal comes in at minus six. Well, that minus six dB signal is exceeding that threshold by four dB. So the compressor is gonna come in and it's gonna say, okay, you're over by four dB and I'm only allowed to have you be one dB over for every four. So even though you came in at minus six, I'm turning you down to minus nine because that's all that's allowed. It's turning that four dB of extra level into only one dB of extra level. And at eight to one, it's turning eight dB of extra level into only one dB of extra level. So you can see how that would naturally be more aggressive. I know it's kind of confusing to think about. Um, truthfully, it doesn't matter. You don't have to think about it in that way. Like I just said, all you really need to know is that a lower ratio is gentler, more smooth, subtle compression, and higher ratios will sound more obvious and dramatic. And once you go above 10 to one, um, that's classically considered limiting. And a brick wall limiter basically means nothing is getting past that threshold. It really just pins something down in place. The attack control determines how quickly the compressor will start reacting. For example, a 30 millisecond attack well, that means that as soon as the signal crosses that threshold, it's gonna wait 30 milliseconds, then start turning down the signal. And again, I want you to just simplify this in your mind to think about fast attack, medium attack, slow attack. So if a fast attack grabs the signal very quickly. So that means it's going to reduce transients, right? Because it's gonna kick in right away. Whereas a slower attack is gonna allow more of the transient through before it clamps down. And here's where we really start getting into the magic and the power of compression. And remember how I said it kind of plays funny tricks on our ears? Well, when you let more transient through and then compress, what our ears actually hear is that you've emphasized the transient. And that's because relative to the rest of the signal, the transient is now 
louder. So that's why a slow attack on a compressor will make a snare drum or any type of drum sound more punchy. It's emphasized that transient by letting some through and then compressing the signal. So let me do a quick demo of attack time here for you. Let's listen to these drums. So here's a compressor on the drum bus. Uh, let's go ahead and just crank up the compression. So I'm just gonna turn down the threshold, which is gonna mean uh, there's gonna be more compression. So right now we're at a 30 millisecond attack time, so it's letting a lot of those transients through. Let me mute our uh, parallel smash compression bus here. Now if we... Now if we use a faster attack time, watch, we're gonna get more compression because it's gonna start hitting the transients. Hear how it's really squashing those transients on the faster attacks. And then as it gets slower, it's gonna start letting more of those transients through. So when we get to 30 here, uh, we can really see, we can really hear kind of the full transient uh, on the drums. And by the way, a good tip if you're kind of trying to set, like what's the ideal attack time here? You can really just crank up the compression. So either really bring down that threshold a lot. So you're doing a lot of gain reduction or turn up the input a lot. So you're doing a lot of uh, gain reduction. And that then you can kind of fiddle with the attack time and see where you're getting the right uh, amount of transient through the compressor and then you can dial it back to get the amount that you want. So that's just a tip for, you know, it, it can be kind of subtle uh, when you're doing only a little bit of compression, it's kind of hard to hear the different attack and release times, but if you really just crank it up, try to find those settings and then dial it back and fine tune it after. So let me reset this here and then I'll give you one more example. Let's go over to the snare drum. So this snare track is already compressed. But again, if we crank this up. Now watch what happens if we go to really fast attack time. We lose the, the crack of the transient because it's getting all, all um, grabbed and turned down by the, by the compressor. Now if we start to loosen it up. Well, now we have a little bit of attack coming through, but it still sounds a bit choked. Now we're, now we're hearing a lot of the transient come through. Even more. And then we can dial it back, find a more reasonable amount of compression. There we go. So that's a helpful way to kind of set the ideal attack time. Just crank it up, move the attack around until you find uh, where you like it, and then dial back the compression. And after attack, we've got release. And release is just how quickly the compressor returns or releases the signal back to its original volume. So a fast release is going to very quickly let the signal go back to its original level after it kicks in. So the signal hits the threshold, compressor kicks in based on ratio and attack time, and then with a fast release, it's just gonna be like, boom, compress, and then give it right back. Whereas a slow release, it's gonna return the signal to its original level more gradually, more slowly. So it kicks in, it compresses, and then it gently eases the signal back to where it was the longer the release time is. And again, you wanna simplify this in your mind, all right? So a slower release, that just means it's gonna have a, more of a smoother compression sound because it's changing the level less drastically. Whereas a faster release sounds more aggressive because the level's getting turned down and then it's getting returned back up uh, very rapidly. The level's changing very quickly. So let's do a quick demo for you here using a drum room track. So right now this compressor is at the fastest possible release time. You can see the meter here, it's, it's letting go of the signal fairly quickly. That means we're kind of compressing the transients and then letting it go. So that's having the effect of kind of um, bringing up the ambience in between the drum hits. Now if we slow down the release time, 
we lose that effect because it's not returning the signal fast enough. And this release gets really slow, look at that. In fact, the release is so slow there that it's not even letting go before the next uh, drum hit. We kind of lose that ambience because it's just turning down the signal that's just kind of staying down because it doesn't get a chance to fully release. And then if we bring it all the way back up, we get that ambience. So there's a quick demo of release time and we'll dig into that a little more. I'll give you some more examples of that in a minute. Finally, we have the gain control or the output control on the compressor. And this is really just controlling the uh, final output of the compressor, right? It's also called makeup gain sometimes. And essentially this is just there because a compressor is turning the signal down. So sometimes you need to turn it back up at the end to get it back to the level you need in the mix or the level that you need to go into the next plugin or into the next piece of gear. So pretty simple there. So yes, essentially a compressor is just a level control and it certainly is very useful in controlling dynamics, making things more even, more audible, like we said. But this play between the ratio, the attack and the release, this is where the magic is. And this is something that takes time and practice to, to really get a hold of. But let me illustrate just a few ways that compressors become the most powerful sonic shaping tool in the mix. All right, we already talked about emphasizing transients, right? Especially common in drums with a slow attack time, letting that transient through before it compresses. But what if you do the opposite? Well, I just kind of showed you uh, and, and gave you an example on a drum room track, but what would happen if you had a fast attack and a fast release on the drum room track? Well, if you think it through, it's gonna clamp down on those transients with the fast attack, then it's gonna let it go immediately. And so that means that the sound in between the hits gets louder and the result is that the character and the ambience of the room is now emphasized, right? Transients reduced, ambience increased. So that's why heavy compression on room tracks, drum room tracks is very common. It's because with a compressor, we can actually increase the amount of ambience and natural reverb that we hear in a track. It can actually make a room sound bigger. So what would happen if you had a fast attack and a slower release or a medium to slow release? Well, you're gonna have the transient, the initial transient be softened by that fast attack and reduced. Then the, the level's gonna kind of gradually, smoothly return back to normal. And the result of that is that it's going to sound a little further away. It's gonna be pushed back in the mix. So think about a drum or a tambourine. If it's in the room two feet away from you, those transients, every single hit sounds really loud. It's like a big, hit. Uh, every hit is a big spike hitting your ears, right? But if you take that same tambourine or drum and put it 20 feet away from you, well, that spike kind of dissipates, right? It, it's, it's not like a big, um, it's not hitting our ears as hard. And so that's how you can use attack time to reduce transients and it actually has the effect of pushing things back in the mix. So you can use fast attack to push things back. You can use slower attacks to enhance those transients and bring things more up front and more forward in the mix. I love to do that on vocal tracks. So if you have a uh, kind of a fast to medium attack, uh, just enough to let the start of the word get through it before it starts compressing, and then a fast release on a vocal, well, the compressor kicks in right after the start of the word gets through. And now the start of the word now sounds louder than the rest because you kind of emphasize that transient or that attack of the vocal. And so the result of that is voila, the vocal sounds more intense, more upfront because those consonants are emphasized. And if you go and listen to any mainstream rock or pop song, listen to how much the consonants, those C's, those T's, you know, the, the t -t -t, those, those consonants really just jump out of the speakers. And this makes the vocal sound so much more energetic. It makes it sound like the singer singing 10 times harder than they actually were. And that heavy vocal compression, like doing a lot of gain reduction in this way, it also means that the breaths in between, the space in between the words gets emphasized. So do all the really subtle, low-level characteristics of how the vocal sounds. So that's why heavy compression on a vocal is really an amazing tool to bring out all the feeling and uniqueness of a singer. And you're going to hear that in action across all of my mixes in this training. So now I hope you're starting to grasp really the true power of compression. And it's just, it's beyond just a level control. It's like a character control. You can mellow a sound out or you can make it more aggressive. You can bring it up front or you can push it back in the mix. And so you wanna really experiment with different compressors for different flavors. And we'll touch on some flavors 
real quick. Um, so in the days of hardware compressors before plugins, you know, these compressors were built with different components inside them, which would all sound different, right? Like tubes versus solid state transistors. Um, I don't really know that much about the hardware components or how they work and all the, the really nerdy tech stuff behind it. I just know that different materials make different sounds. And a bunch of these older hardware compressors or current hardware compressors, they also had hardwired thresholds or attack and release times. And so they therefore became go-tos for certain things in the mix. Now I'll give you just a few examples. The 1176, it's got a fixed threshold and that's why we have the input knob there. But you do have a ratio control so you can really get more aggressive uh, with the compressor up to 12 or 8 to 12 to 20 to 1 and you do have attack and release controls on this but even if you've got attack and release controls on a compressor um, the range of that attack and release can be different on every compressor right so a slow attack on an 1176 is still kind of a fast attack compared to other compressors now this blue version of the 1176 it's known to have more of an aggressive sound it adds a certain saturation and subtle distortion to the signal. So sometimes you're using compression to do a whole bunch of things, right? It's controlling the level, it's affecting the shape and the aggression of it, but then it's also adding more size and more character with whatever type of saturation that it's doing. Here's another popular one, the LA-2A. It's got a fixed threshold, um, just an input and an output gain control fixed attack and release, uh, fixed ratio, and actually the way this compressor works is actually wired to kind of have different ratios and attack and release based on the signal that's that's coming in. So that's kind of interesting too. Uh, this has been a favorite uh, for many years on bass and vocals. To my ears, it's a fairly smooth level control. It doesn't really go super aggressive in the way I like, but it can control level nicely. Whereas the LA-3A has a faster attack, it also adds some really nice mid-range saturation and fullness, so I love it on electric guitars. And of course, what I'm showing here are plug-in models of old hardware units. I'm showing the Waves ones here, um, but almost every plug-in company out there has their own models of these compressors. And there are tons more examples. Those are just a few for you um, that I commonly use in my mixes and that you'll see throughout this training. Um, remember, there are no rules. Okay, try out different compressors see what they do, you'll start to get a favorite for certain things. And many of these compressors are just tried and true across decades, right? Like the SSL channel compressor sounds great on drums, the 1176 sounds great on vocals, etc. Like I just said, this the uh, LA-3A sounds great on electric guitars. So you can follow what I'm using in the training here to get started. Uh, and you'll you'll get great results, right? Because they're tried and true. They're, they're, they've been loved and used for decades on certain instruments, certain compressors on, on certain tracks. And even if you don't hear all the subtleties right away, just keep using them, keep doing what I show you here. And over time, things will just start to fall into place and, and start to click for you. So there you have it, the foundation of compression.